Of all the talk of North Carolina being a battleground state with swing voting potential, the reality is that the same political demographic will turn out to vote for the same group of politicians with the same ideals. I contend that there is a massive psychological operation, or PSYOP, being carried out in this and other states by corporate sponsored media groups in an effort to mislead people who still have faith in the so-called democratic process. The most obvious fact is that North Carolina hasn't voted for a democratic presidential candidate since Jimmy Carter and was on nobody's list of battleground states a year ago. But now public polls and an avalanche of democratic voter registrations indicate North Carolina is no longer a safe Republican state. And McCain's efforts to win it its 15 electoral votes don't match Obama's full court press. But that makes absolutely no sense at all. A seasoned veteran like McCain would be well aware of new voter registration patterns and minority turnout projections. If he seems not to care, then that would tell you that the information is either inaccurate or inconsequential. My theory is that it's a little bit of both. In all fairness to those who do not do everything the television tells them to do, I would like to more closely examine the claims supporting a change in this political climate. At first glance, North Carolina is an unlikely battleground. This is, after all, where George W. Bush won a comfortable 12-point victory in 2004, despite the presence of a North Carolinian on the Democratic ticket where twice as many voters said they were conservatives as said they were liberals and where no Democratic presidential candidate has won in 30 years. But the past isn't necessarily prologue in this fast-growing state with its influx of urban, higher-income professionals, the sort that Obama tries to attract. And the recent surge in the voter rolls in Democratic areas making this an interesting state to watch in 2008. When I talk to my friends, colleagues, and co-workers about voting for Obama, almost all of them say that, yes, in fact, that is their intent. I see Obama-Biden signs on bumper stickers around town, and I hear from genuinely honest people who agree with the stance on issues that the candidate's platform represents. Of those things, however, are part of a deception. How many people actually vote for the people they say they're going to, especially when it is socially and politi politically correct to give that answer? Even if they do, how can we verify the accuracy of political demographics? It is true that white-collar workers have poured into the city of Charlotte, a financial hub in the South, while recent college, gra college graduates and their young families have been drawn to plentiful jobs and quality education in the academic research triangle, including Raleigh, Durham, and Chapel Hill. In addition, retirees concerned about health care and the environment have settled in both sides of the state, from the eastern Atlantic coastline to the western mountains. These are factors to be considered but so are religion, ethnic heritage, military support, education, income, and occupation. So what about the polls? North Carolina is one of the tightest sites in 2008 during the presidential election. Pollster.com shows Barack Obama with only a slight 2.2 degree edge over John McCain. Nate Silver's popular 538.com shows it even closer. By his analysis, Obama's lead is a mere 4%, making North Carolina the tightest state in the country. My response is, so what about the polls? Polls showed most Americans were opposed to invading Iraq, yet, yet it still happened. To this day, almost every major media poll shows that 50% of Americans and 75% of New Yorkers do not believe the official story of what happened on 9-11. Yet, anyone who tries to investigate it is silenced or ridiculed as mentally unstable or unpatriotic. To be even more practical, think of our generation and our geographic location in the country and the not-so-distant past of the entire region.
Segregation in commercial environments in this state was still being practiced as recently as the early 1970s. Former Dixiecrat Senator Jesse Helms would be turning in his grave at the prospect that his beloved North Carolina would help put Barack Obama into the White House, if that were in fact possible. Helms, who died at 86 after retiring from the Senate five years ago, greeted Carol Mosley Braun, the first African-American woman elected to the Senate, by following her into an elevator and singing Dixie. He had promised colleague Orrin Hatch that he would sing the unofficial anthem of the southern states in the Civil War until he made Miss B Mosley Braun cry. Not only did she not cry, she went on to sponsor legislation that led to the eventual demise of sympathy for lifelong segregationists. This in turn led to her defeat in a re-election campaign for Senate as her district was rezoned and a gigantic number of swing votes were counted against her. If voter demographics are correct, that still does not explain the meteoric rise to prominence displayed by Senator Obama, who most did not know existed until a few years ago. It's not as if he has been the only African American candidate qualified to run for the presidency, and certainly not the most experienced. Part of the reason for his rapid success is his media portrayal, which we've already found to be unreliable. Is part of the reason behind McCain's apathy in North Carolina due to his advisor sensing that the likely Obama supporters are part of that media hype? Or is it something much more sinister? It had previously occurred to me that John McCain seems awfully cool for someone who has been behind in the polls from virtually day one. Does he know something that we don't? Absolutely he does. To examine my theory on the lack of validity to North Carolina being a so-called battleground state, we need to take a closer look at the state voting process for rules, guidelines, and regulations. North Carolina is one of only two states in the country where straight ticket voting does not count a vote for president. For example, if someone marks a box to vote straight ticket Republican but does not also mark a vote for John McCain at the top of the ballot, McCain won't get a vote. The result is that every presidential election, North Carolina has an unusually high number of what is known as undervotes, or ballots that are cast but not registered a vote for president. However, some undervotes are intentional. Voters who don't like any of the political candidates leave it blank on purpose. Some undervotes can also be chalked up to voting machine errors since undervotes are somewhat different depending on how votes are counted. But the fact that North Carolina has one of the five highest undervote rates in the country makes it clear the state's confusing straight ticket ballots are the leading factor. This is also another misleading factor in examining poll results. In the year 2000, George Bush won North Carolina by 400,036 votes. That means a vote swing of around 200,000 to the Democrats would supposedly make this a real battleground. So where could the Democrats find or the Republicans lose that many votes? Obama would need to combine a strong African-American vote with upscale suburbanites. That would start with newer voters, and there are plenty of those. There are 6 million registered voters in North Carolina now, 500,000 more than in 2004, enough to make a difference, supposedly. As previously stated, the state's population distribution has changed over the past decade. Business people flock to Charlotte and Research Triangle Park, one of the leading U.S. technology hubs. Most Hispanics and Asians arrived during the economic boom. So what does all this have to do with the climate of social change? Nothing. In North Carolina, the Obama campaign has aired constant negative attack ads against McCain. Liberals are playing to rural residents' sympathy throughout the state by scapegoating the urban areas blaming them for Department of Transportation subsidy inequality. Our former mayor, who ran mayoral campaigns against a string of absolute nobodies with zero financial base, is now running for governor on the same basic platform as Bush too. Senator Dole is not even trying to defend herself against critics who claim to never actually see her in this state. And I received a really annoying recording on a telephone call of Hank Williams Jr. calling to tell me to vote for McCain. 
In the grand scheme of American politics, it's all meaningless. Not only North Carolinians, but all Americans should have realized that the so-called democratic process that we have been raised to respect and admire has in the last two elections shown its true nature. The facts of the matter are simple and easy to understand. Technically, there is no popular vote for the U.S. presidency. The electors who are appointed by each state's legislature are not legally required to cast their vote for the candidate whom the state official declares the winner. In fact, they are not legally required to vote at all. As the past eight years have shown, the state legislature can decide the election regardless of the popular vote totals. So why has this not been an issue until recently? Because traditionally Americans have been manipulated by circumstances in which no one would question the outcome. President Rutherford B. Hayes, for example, lost his election in the popular and electoral vote by a landslide. Yet when the electors met in Washington, they simply said that they thought the voters were mistaken and elected Hayes anyway. Abraham Lincoln was elected in 1860 after losing the border states and not being on the ballot in much of the South. In recent history, John F. Kennedy lost the popular vote, won the electoral vote in the narrowest margin up to that point, and yet we are taught that he was beloved by all Americans as an instrument of social change. Both Richard Nixon and Jimmy Carter won both votes in a landslide, yet after being betrayed by Wall Street, every single internal U.S. government agency and their own cabinet members, Nixon was forced to resign and Carter was defeated by a B-movie actor with almost no experience who coincidentally announced his campaign in Philadelphia, Mississippi, the site of the KKK Police Department murder of civil rights workers 16 years prior. Media manipulation works both ways, creating false hope and creating situations that are hopeless. Either because of or despite these factors, most Republican analysts have confidence that McCain will carry the state and that rural blue-collar voters in the eastern flatlands and western mountains who typically vote Democratic in local elections will come through in the end for McCain. These analysts cite how George W. Bush comfortably won the state twice and how Democrats couldn't even win it when John Edwards, then a North Carolina senator, was on the party's vice presidential nominee. It is interesting that North Carolina is being considered a so-called battleground state, but I consider it to be just that, an interesting item of future trivia. In any case, prepare for fallout from the battle in the so-called battleground state. And as a footnote, some of you know this and some of you do not, I'm a very harsh critic of former president, so-called President Ronald Reagan, but Reagan, when he announced in Philadelphia, Mississippi in 1980 that he was running for president, he had Klansmen on stage with him. They had segregationist banners and states' rights manifestos. Some people do not understand that. Some people claim they've never heard that. Reagan launched his 1980 presidential campaign in Philadelphia, Mississippi, and he was invited to do so by U.S. Representative, later Senator, Majority Leader Trent Lott. In Philadelphia, Reagan endorsed states' rights and in return was endorsed by the Ku Klux Klan, which was present on that occasion. In 1964, Philadelphia was the site where civil rights workers Andrew Goodman, Michael Schwerner, and James Cheney were murdered in the name of states' rights as they attempted to register blacks to vote in Mississippi. In 1980, Reagan was sending a states' rights signal to all conservatives north and south that their states would be given freedom even if it was at the expense of justice. Now, regardless of whether you believe in the U.S. political process or not, or the so-called democratic process, you have to understand the story from all sides, and you have to understand why some people do not avail themselves of the process. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for their support. There's too many people to name, uh, but definitely uh, add the new channels on the video sites and keep searching for truth. Thank you.